making a life worth living and a retirement worth having is really about having people in our lives who help us to move forward, who really help to us to understand what's going on for us and why things aren't going well and why we feel like we are openly cursed in some way if life isn't going on. I recently had a woman tell me that she literally thought she was cursed with money and I thought, well, that could be possible. I mean, sometimes we put ourselves in positions with the Lord that don't really make sense to us and often not to him because we're not learning fast enough, we're not growing well enough, or we're simply not listening to what we've promised him. Sometimes we make these pacts with God that we say, if I find a man that's like this or does this or does that, then I'll openly love him forever. But that doesn't always work because sometimes that man that's produced is not at all who we thought was was supposed to be, look like, or be anything remotely like in our lives. But then we realize that the God knows his children, that openly he knows who is right for who, he knows precisely why, and he knows exactly what needs to happen in a person's life to make them ready for that change. You see, when we make these little packs with God, we're really putting ourselves out there. Sometimes we're not realizing how much we do to damage a person's life. We often think, it's not my responsibility how that person reacted. That's a very common phrase that a lot of books on codependency talk about saying to people, that we have no responsibility for what we say to them, what we do to them, and literally it's how they choose to respond. A lot of people throw that back in your face literally when you're talking about things and they say, that's how you felt about it, that's how you chose to be, that's how you experienced me, that's not literally what I was trying to accomplish. Now when we have lost conversation with people, it's really about what does the Bible, for those of us who practice that faith or along that lineage of faith, say about discord. The Bible literally says, when there's a discord, you go to that brother in love and you talk about it. You try and talk over it. You try and make peace with one another. It also says that if that doesn't work, you literally take another person with you. You ask another person to um, involve themselves on your behalf to help to make peace. When that literally doesn't work, then of course you go to the next level. You talk to a pastor, you talk to a leader of sorts in someone's life, and you hope that person is mature enough to do enough investigative work in terms of their conversations with you, conversations with them, in order to bring about, okay, where do we find the common ground here? How do I literally help these individuals to find love in their hearts for one another? Because at one time, in friendships, in loving relationships, in partnerships, in business, and in life, we can often find that common ground. Now, whiteboarding things is really an awesome opportunity for every person involved in any type of project, no matter whether it's an individual relationship that's gone awry or whether it's a large group organization or church that's trying to produce some results for themselves. A lot of times people don't realize how important and valuable whiteboarding can be in a mass setting. I often say that churches really need to have whiteboards or some sort of a prayer wall where they can literally allow people from the congregation, people from the parish, to list on those boards what they're looking for, what prayers they have. I remember one mega church did this at a holiday time and I thought it was wonderful. It wasn't the first time I had thought of that idea, but it was a great idea. Now what might make that powerful prayer wall even better is if there was two parts to that prayer wall where literally it had lines on it where people could list the challenge they were having and another person in the congregation could offer a solution, a true solution that would help raise that vibration of that living soul, that life force if you will. We often don't think about life forces very much in the Christian realm. Life force is typically something we hear in Star Trek realms or Star Wars realms or, let's face it, sci-fi pictures use this a lot, talking about life forces. But when we're talking about life forces in the reality of the world, we're really talking about a person whose life is in a forceful movement forward. You see, we're all literally aging, which is why I sell a product that is geared towards helping people to establish good cellular health. On the cellular level, that's where all the pro productive genes are and the gene pool for our life is. It also is where disease sets in early on the onset of all sorts of things. 
And literally, while we can't prove that what I sell is going to prevent, cure, or, or take care of any literal disease or any literal problem, what we can definitely say is that it is a preventive maintenance technique. You see, in life, we have lots of opportunities to do things to prevent uh, bad health from setting in an old age. We can work on keeping our weight low. We can work on eating healthily like my mother does prolifically. She literally has salmon every single night of the week because she's bored out of her tears with the menu that they have, but also because we have a gluten challenge in our family that sort of sets in late in life. It wasn't there early on, probably because God knew we needed bread and other sorts of pan, which is what it's called in Japanese culture and other foreign uh, nations where it was in, adapted from to the Japanese language. But I guess my point is that literally we are looking for a way to produce a life worth living and retirement worth having. In order to do that, we have to produce good foods. We have to drink a lot of water, as my mother says, and we have to really make sure we're having a good old poop is what she says. Have you had a bowel movement today? It's the first thing she'll ask me if I ever have a headache, but that's a sort of a family joke now. But so is getting underwear from my parents uh, when my father was still with us late into our even adulthood, which we sort of thought all thought, thought was a little odd. Now, there's a funny story about how my brother and sister-in-law kind of handled that one year to make sure mom would stop doing that for them. <laughs> as, as a married couple, they just thought it was out of this world. So they literally got my mother some very risque underwear at her age, and I think she was probably in her late 60s at that time. It was hilarious Christmas gift, but I'm just really talking off cuff here. What I'm really saying is that in life, we have opportunities to tell people we love them. And sometimes we have to hold on a long time. You see, love is what gives people hope in this world. When we lose love, when we lose our opportunities in life, when we run out of money, when we run out of resources, when we run out of time, or like in my case, I've had people damage my computer equipment in the middle of the night because, God forbid, an old man fell asleep in a parking lot and left some of his windows down just a little bit so that he could, God forbid, breathe. But we have monsters in the world who literally think that an open window is an open invitation to open someone's vehicle, to monkey around, to throw receipts all over the floor, to try and make the person look not well, to take their property, to move them around, to take their property that they put in their vehicle and put it over in their storage unit like the individual doesn't know what they put in their car. People who are monsters in this world do shit like that, excuse the language, I should really work on that. But in life, we are producing language that comes about from the Lord. Now, if you don't think that the God doesn't swear, you're out of your mind. But in truth, it's not about that. It's about the blasphemy that people tell themselves that they literally think they're holy when they're really not. Now, when a man is producing an audio cast like this, he's really looking at how can I do this in an easygoing way? If my computer is not working regularly when I go into places to plug in, it makes it awfully difficult for me to produce a life, a portfolio, a new opportunity for my own self, let alone for helping anyone else market themselves. I used to have an Apple iPad. I've never really told this story, but I'm going to today. I was so sick and tired of seeing police on my path that I literally thought that Apple, being a, a unit that cannot easily be shut off, I really miss the old days where we had laptops where you could know 100% that your internet was off. My gal had an internet-based computer which someone destroyed in my apartment. I literally never allowed that before, but it had a switch on the side that allowed you to turn it on and turn it off. I loved that traditional technology. There's no one else then can turn on your internet from afar or from a distance because that switch gives you total control. We need to get back to those sort of days. Now, literally, I was telling sort of a story about the situation, so let's move forward to it. When I'm talking about the monsters in the room, I'm really talking about the people who think they have rights to take over another person's life. They literally think that if I push on this person enough, if I crap on their life enough, if I literally litigate them enough, they will stop being who they're supposed to become in the Lord's name. Now, what gave that person the right to do that? No one. You see, the Lord God, for those of us who believe in such a faith or such a religion or such a spirituality, really understand that the Lord God puts souls into people. There's a wonderful film by an incredible uh, Latino director that produced a film that sort of showed that illustration. I've talked about it before, of how God puts a soul string inside a human being that is birthed through his parents or her parents. 
it's a wonderful film. I love that film. It's a great history lesson. It's a great cultural forte into the, the Latino or Hispanic community, but it was done by an incredible woman who put that down on his paper, that wonderful story. Now, for some, it was a little more, but for others, it provided a lot of life lessons. But isn't that what film does today? It literally offers us lots of insights into the spiritual realm when it's done well. Sure, there's a lot of crap films, and I'll say it just as I feel, that come out during Halloween that we literally don't need. We don't need our children watching them. We don't need our people watching them. We don't need people scared out of their minds. It's unhealthy. I'm pretty sure God feels that way about all sorts of porn, snuff films, and Halloween films. Why do we need to show that to our children? I don't know. I remember being absolutely appalled when my first experience with my loved one in Japan learned that she showed her eight-year-old a Halloween film. I don't know that that was the title. It might have been a Freddy Krueger for all I know, but what a morbid thing. Now that actor always played the creepy guy because let's face it, he wasn't the most handsome person in the world to everyone. But when we put all that mask on and when we do all those crazy things, it produced for him a life worth living and probably a retirement worth having. He's probably made millions off those films, but how many children's lives has he changed from those storylines? Now, on the one hand, it teaches children to, to, to fear the woods. That's good. On the other hand, it teaches them to fear the Lord, maybe. Not sure. Never really watched them all. Couldn't stand them. But what I'm talking about really is about the reality that when we're looking at are we making a life worth living and retirement having, are we just getting into materialism all the time because we just produced an in paycheck and we've got to go out and spend it? Or are we really looking at how are we investing those dollars into people? You see, it's the investment of dollars in people. It's the investment of time in relationships that produce lives worth living and uh, lives worth living and retirement worth having. You see, it's the people in our life that make all the difference in the world. And when you lose the most important people of your life, when you lose those significant others, when you lose those spiritual soulmates, when you lose those people that you teach things to, when you lose that love of your life, when you lose the one you're dying to marry, it makes a huge difference. Whether that loss comes about from a transition to heaven intentionally, unintentionally, and what I mean by that is God decides when it's time literally to call people home. They have another life to go to. They have lessons to learn. They have wisdom to gain in heaven. There's all sorts of things in literature out there about the people who've done, been there, done that, and returned. But we make storylines out of them. We make movies out of them, like the one that was recently done by that the children's family, and I forget its title. Something about heaven is real or something like that. But openly, we poo-poo anybody who talks to the spirit world today, and that's sort of sad. Yes, there are literally people who fake that stuff. But in my lifetime, I've not seen a lot of people who do that. I've met a lot of people with a lot of gifts. I've met a lot of people who help those who are not faith-bound to find a faith. And literally what I mean by that is folks in the metaphysical community, folks in the spiritualist community. You see, those folks are literally allowing the Trinity to be real for them. That makes all the difference in the world. It makes heaven more real to them. It makes them feel more, more whole. It allows them to produce a life worth living in their souls and eventually retirement worth having because they're projecting onto others this loving peace that there is a Lord God, that there is a Holy Spirit, that there is literally someone who's out there thinking about them beyond who they see in their physical life. Now think about that for those folks who are lonely, for those folks who are socially inept, for those folks who literally have some special education needs, but op openly, we're talking about lives. We're talking about life forces. We're talking literally about how do I make a life worth living and a retirement worth having if someone has just damaged my property? Literally, if someone has just stolen the gifts I've set aside for many months to give at Thanksgiving to say, I'm so grateful for your service to me or to my family. Or literally, someone stole things you set aside for the next opportunity, you saw someone so significant to your life that you went someplace special, you found something totally unique that can never be found again, and literally someone decided to take that from you. So when I'm talking about property, when I talk about the three Ps of personhood, property, and paperwork, I'm literally talking about that. I'm talking about how do we make a life worth living and a retirement worth having if people think that they have the rights to pilfer those things from others. 
And that's the problem we have in America today, that we have gotten away from education. We've gotten literally away from the opportunities in life to teach our children not to thieve. You see, thieving, I believe, is the gateway sin. And what I mean by that is if someone gets away from stealing with stealing something, it literally means that they're ready to take something in terms of personhood, take something in terms of property, and take something in terms of paperwork from something else. And that's what a pastor does, is he talks about these things honestly and openly and says, look, in the Bible it says, thou shall not steal. Now, thou shall not commit a lot of other things is also there, but literally that sort of begins the whole thing for me. You see, it's that theft of someone's property without paying for something that literally says, I am Lord your God in your life, not there is a Lord God in heaven. You see, there's a big difference. When you lord over people, when you steal things from people, when you dishonor them by thinking they're not well, that's not your right to say. It's not even your little right to think because people have the right to do all sorts of things in this world because we live in America. Now, when I'm talking practically about this life, I'm really talking about how do people promote other people? Yes, why? Because people produce products. People produce programs. People produce all sorts of productivity and performance that literally move our world forward. From the time of cavemen all the way to today, we can talk about the evolution of man. We can talk about the evolution of peoples. We can talk about the Tower of Babel and how it separated the languages and the cultures and how they all literally have a godlike structure of some kind. But openly, what we're really talking about is how the Lord has produced for himself and herself a way to be honored by many people of the world. Now, when I talk about this, some of the left-winger Christians are really going to get off their rockers because they want to say that literally only Jesus is the way to heaven. And I'm not sure that God is going to agree with them once they get there. It just might be what they believe this time around. God forbid we learn that the Bible does talk about evolution of man and the Bible does talk about other aspects of reincarnation, but we sort of miss those passages because when they did the, um, <coughs> uh, gosh, the meeting at Narcissi, if I've said it all correctly and I am no priest, please talk to your local Catholic pastor about this, but when they did that meeting, they literally shifted the Bible language, they chose the passages that they were going to continue on with, and that is literally what produced our works today. So when we find other works in the world that have been historic value, like the Dead Sea Scrolls and other sorts of things, we literally need to look at those historically and linguistically and artistically in terms of what practically can we gain from reading those works? What other aspects of the Lord can we understand from reading all sorts of books on the Bible or around that literal period of time in history and all sorts of worlds uh, or countries around the world? There are historic texts that talk about faith, that talk about practically how do we handle ourselves in many situations. But literally, when I'm talking about this in my book, Soul Keepers, I'm using the term soul keepers to talk about that people who love us keep our souls. People who hate us destroy our souls. You see, the people who love us will talk of in soulful ways. They will say, wow, you did that really well. You know, I think this part of your skill sets and talents and abilities might really make a good life worth living and a retirement worth having. And I'd like to introduce you to some people who might know other people who literally might know other people that could possibly get you into a better role in life. You see, it's the relationships we form in the workplace, whether it's in retail land or whether it's in manufacturer's world or whether it's in the professional services industry or literally any industry in the world is required to have people. People are also required to be customers and clients of those programs, services, and productivity, performance, all those Ps that literally I talk about all the time. You see, in manufacturing, there's a pretty simple formula. It's SQDM, which literally comes down to <clears throat> service, quality, morale, and delivery. You see, morale is a significant part of the manufacturing world. I know this because I literally was an interpreter in manufacturing, which was a crazy time in my life because nothing in my life in Japan and my living with a family in Japan allowed me to produce any manufacturing terminology. I literally had to learn it all 
from day one. I had to figure out how to put it into a reasonably decent sentence enough to help somebody understand somebody else in the plant because we had tons of Japanese who came over who spoke not a lick of English. What I ended up producing in the shop floor was how they could produce a cross-cultural communication stream with literally short sentences, with a lot of hand gestures, and literally with allowing the people to use their own minds to figure out and puzzle out what is one person trying to communicate to me about what I'm supposed to do in my performance of my literal job or what am I supposed to learn actually about this technology in order to be able to have a simpler way, a faster, more efficient, a more quality oriented, a higher morale point in my life in doing this physical work that is producing for my family income revenue and resources so uh, we could have a life worth living and retirement worth having. And I've talked a little bit about how I used to train the temporaries because they were just not getting it. They were causing us all kinds of part defects. They were costing us lots of money in repairs and wasting a lot of metal. But the minute I said, look, you've got to understand that you are producing safety parts for this vehicle, that you are protecting a life when this part is done correctly, you're producing a living off this effort you're making. It was amazing how many of those mature visitors and literally what we call temporary workers that help us fill in the gaps when our people were away or ill or we ran out of folks or people transitioned on in life, that literally they started to get it. They started to get that they could have a full-time job if they just really understood what they were doing in life. You see, that's what an educator does. Is he takes tough concepts and he breaks them down and makes it personal. So when I'm talking about all these different things in one little audio cast, you're like, where the heck is this man going with his conversation? But to see the full circle that we're trying to really get to is that life is not as indelicate as one thinks. Life is complicated. Life has a lot of intertwinings of all sorts of realms. And when we literally think that our life has been cursed in some way, shape or form, we've got to stop and say, who did I mess over? Who have I lied to about my feelings? Who have I destroyed in my talk with other people instead of talking directly with them like it says to be doing so in the Bible when there's discord? Who have I failed to make peace with? Who am I still literally warring with? Because in truth, that war allows me to keep them in my life even though it's not a healthy way to have them in my life. You see, warring in the world is really sort of about that. It's about who's got power over who. And we don't like war. It kills our people. It destroys relationships. It destroys the beauty of the earth. It destroys buildings. It destroys people's lives. It makes children homeless. It destroys all aspects of the world that we have to really focus on in ways of getting our lives back together. You see, once you put peace in your life, once you put peace in your soul, you look at the person in a different way. You say, I'm going to forgive this individual because they made a mistake. But the monsters in the world never forgive and the monsters in the world attack people's lives. They say belittling things. They force themselves on those people. They literally say, I know you had something else planned for the day, but I'm going to demand you do this right now because I want to do this right now in your life. And that is not a loving thing. You see, most people are not with each other 24-7. Now, I had a life partner and I was literally almost with that person 24-7 because we did a lot of things together. We produced a life that way. We produced a retirement, sort of, but it didn't quite work out the way I had planned or the way she planned. Everyone else sort of started monkeying around in that relationship, giving her odd ideas about what relationships should be like, what she should expect, what she should demand, and all those sorts of things, which wasn't their little right to do. In other relationships, I had people who were mentors to these other people, literally saying, this is odd, you shouldn't do this, you are married, you shouldn't have this. But who was giving them their orders? Was it Lord God saying, this is a loving, healthy relationship that has no innuendo whatsoever? Or were they violating our trust because they were talking about the relationship inappropriately? And that sort of happened with someone who is literally the most significant person of my entire life. That person put me on a path to God. That individual showed me a tool that saved my life millions of times. And I can never produce enough magic in the world to feel not loved by God. It's not true that I long to show her the love of the Lord through this thing she taught me. I can't wait, literally, to show her what can magic can be produced 
when you love God and when you put life in order. But there are people in this world who want to say all sorts of things about what I practice in terms of my faith in a Christian God, my faith in allowing other aspects of the world and other readings on the Lord to impact and influence how I choose to pursue the Bible and other literal religious works, other spirituality forms, other understandings of how I can inspire myself to love God more in the world. Now, as I talk a little long today, I'm really talking about making peace with people. You see, once we make peace with the Lord and we say, okay, God, I'm on your path now. Show me how I'm supposed to handle this. Tell me what to do. Allow me to produce a life worth living and eventually a retirement with having. Everything in the world changes. Everything is all different. And when we don't do that, we literally are monsters in people's lives. We do things illegally on their names. We elicit ill will in other people. We produce major scenes in their lives that destroy their opportunities in life. And we literally mess people over because we think we're going to manhandle someone or threaten their lives with jail or other things that is inappropriate. There's all kinds of jails. There's physical jail. There's prison. There's all sorts of ways to mess someone up legally. But the truth is there are other types of jails too where we literally put someone in a jail in our mind and we say, you are so ill, we are not going to tolerate you anymore. But that's not what we do, is it? We isolate people. We destroy their lives. We harm them by doing malicious things to undermine everything they literally do to try to produce a life worth living and a retirement worth having. Whether it be a simple loan from an individual or whether it be a loan from a bank or whether it be the pursuit of a credit card or whether it be someone putting their name on other documentation and pretending to be them, that is a violation of Lord God's law. So when we get back to the concept of the three P's of personhood, paperwork, and literally property, when someone violates any of those items, they literally are saying, I am Lord in your life. And that is a violation of the U.S. Constitution, I believe. I'm not sure there's enough clauses or articles in the U.S. Constitution that literally says, stay the hell out of my personhood, paperwork, and property. But that should. It should literally be Article 1 or Article 0 if there's such a thing. The foundation needs to shift a little in people's minds. People see this land as the land of milk and honey, but there is a responsibility. We all have responsibilities to do what we feel will get us the best amount of money in the shortest amount of time. There are people who produce a living working 40 to 60 hours a week and they love to do it. We have people who don't want to work that hard but they have to because of the responsibilities and requirements of the position. A lot of teaching jobs are like that. A lot of people don't really get paid what they're being paid because they have to work long hours to produce what they teach to a lot of children who are not well behaved in school because their parents have literally not told them what their expectations are for them to be like in school. You see, we don't have the same Asian qualities of saying, not only do you represent yourself here, but you represent your family when you are in those places. That has good and bad aspects. We've certainly learned that in the Japanese culture and other Asian cultures that put too much pressure on that requirement to be a part of the family of life. But what I'm practically talking about today is putting other people first. Literally saying, am I holding someone hostage in this relationship because I'm demanding that they produce a better lie to me? Or am I literally saying, listen, we've had a discord. I'd like to repair it. I'd like us to talk in live. I'd like us to go for coffee. I'd like us to eat a meal and break bread together over something we both enjoy. I'd like us to drink wine. I'd like us to laugh and cry and vent. And at the end of it all, have the promise that we're going to love each other and go forward in peace and harmony. We're going to reproduce an opportunity for love, light, and honor and regard for one another because at one time in our life, we held that for one another. Now that's how most people should do it, but the problem is it requires responsibility. It requires a willingness to say, I made a major mistake on this person's life. You see, when people are too proud to admit how they destroyed someone's life, it literally means they feel that they're Lord God in someone's life. But the Lord might view it differently. The Lord might say, you overstepped your boundaries here in personhood, paperwork, or property. You literally went too far in your game of thinking you were in control here. 
and openly at some point God is going to punish those who do those things. Whether he literally just kills them on the spot, whether he literally takes them home in their soul, or what I like to hear and being said is serves their head on a platter. Now that seems to be a little word that folks say across the world, but I'm going to make sure folks get what that means. It's not like the old Henry VIII concept of heads on a platter. It's literally about the Lord God showing you your own sin in your own life and saying, look, you are an imperfect soul too. This person deserves love, honor, and regard. You violated that when you did these things, and it's time to make amends in a way that makes sense to that individual, not in a way that you want to demand or command on that person's life. You see, when we put it on the other person, when we say, there is literally something this person is trying to accomplish, and I will try to do what I can to help them accomplish that goal, then we've totally changed the dynamic of how we feel, how we look to them, and literally whether or not we'll be regarded. It can never be a manipulation game because you're doing it all in front of God. You cannot lie in front of the Lord. When you steal a person's life from them, you have destroyed your rights to do one thing other than to be punished by the Lord. I literally think that's why some people struggle. I literally think that's why some people complain about being cursed since meeting someone. No, the curse is that you failed to love the individual. The curse is that you failed to talk to them to realize that maybe God put that person in your life to teach you some life lessons that you're failing to learn about responsibility. Or maybe they put that person in your life to have it be a situation of taming of the shrew, that that person is the only person then can get you to stop and literally think about what you do, how you say it, how you feel to others, and to help you say, look, you have wonderful qualities in these areas, but here's where you're harming your life with other people. Now, I've got a plenty of family members who want to turn me into a monster, but the people who know me, like me, and trust me view it completely differently. I have other pastors who want to crap all over me when I give suggestions in their programs, but that literally is their own ego, too. Because when people take it in and write it down, that sort of says it's important to them. So the pastor can't say whether it's important or not, other than the fact that their parishioners wrote it down, like it was sort of a good idea. So when we talk about life worth living and retirements worth having, having we're, we are literally looking for how do we help someone to go on further in life? How do we make sure we don't do something that destroys a life? from our own stupid actions. There are many people in this world who like to pull guns and weapons and do sort of macho sort of things and then produce dramatic scenes in people's lives. The problem is all the other people that then get involved destroy that life. There's literally no going back from it. It produces hatred in the world. It produces lies in the world. It produces a lot of difficulty for a person, an individual, and the Lord God is going to hold you accountable to the end of the earth for that one. There is no way out of that situation. No individual can say they do not have an accountability to the Lord, even if they literally don't believe in God. They will die and they will learn that there is an accountability to the Lord. Now, is that supposed to be a scary fire and brimstone sort of thing? No. It's literally saying if you don't get with the program of loving on people, of making peace in this world, of destroying less lives and building other people up and seeing their values to society, then you literally cannot go on in life. People around the world love each other, makes peace in the world. People around the world hate each other for stupid idiotic things, like I've seen in many Asian countries, means that we don't get on in the world. It means that we literally have war, that our children are going off to be killed in war, and openly it produces the destructive nature of bombs, uh, chemical weapons, intellectual weapons, psychological weapons, inaudible weapons that destroy a life, a mind, and a soul that is not yours to do. Lord God is very clear. I am the Lord your God, and no other shall be above me. People sort of forget that. They try to be above other people in their life, and it's what destroys their own life and others in particular. So this has been Blake Ensign of Blaze Communications, talking a little bit long-winded today about people, property, and paperwork, personhood, 
paperwork, and property, however you might like to talk about it, the promotion of people literally produces the programs, the products, and the performance and the productivity of the people in this world. You're either on the path to peace or you're on the war path like the native Indians of old, taking over tribes, stealing their women, destroying their lives, stealing their property, ruining people. Now, I'm not putting native Indians down. I love their spirituality. It is totally in tune with Lord God. We are out of tune with the earth. We have proven it. And for God's sakes, people, we need some more shaded areas in parking lots so that those stupid people who leave children, dogs, and other things of life and life forces in their vehicles don't kill them every single time. Now, I'm making a funny, I suppose, but I'm also making fun of the idioticness of people who think that a child won't suffocate. It takes a matter of minutes and a hot day for air to seep out of a vehicle, and that is outrageous. So again, I'm wrapping up with something odd perhaps, something profound perhaps, but I'm literally saying, stop and think about what you're doing that harms someone else, and literally to realize that you will be fully accountable before the Lord for it all.